So this time, like I said, we're going to be talking about the authority, and we're going to notice some patterns here, and we're going to talk about the imagery of the Bible and what that imagery of the Bible represents to us now in this day. Uh, I got a few more slides than normal because I wasn't really one I wanted to break into two, so I'm just going to just work with me here. But we have to understand the setting that Israel was in, and, and through much of Scripture, <laughs> I think I got like 17 verses. No one can say that I didn't use Scripture today. All right, because it is there. I want you to know that you know that you know that I'm not just using a verse. I didn't cherry pick a verse somewhere and then tell you the Jeremy Burton commentary. Right? I'm going to be using scripture after scripture to back up what I believe I'm, I'm telling you, and you'll see it here. So um, here we go. So let's talk about the situation that Israel's in before they crossed over into the promised land. Let's talk about something that happened. I want to go backtrack just a little bit. I know last week we kind of ended off with them going into the promised land, but we need to go back just a second. Let's go back to Numbers 13, uh, Numbers 13, 32 to 33. So this is when they bring out the spies, right? And obviously in this company, a part of this company was Joshua and Caleb. And they were in this, they were the two out of the 12 that were like, hey, let's take this. Let's take this land, right? So they brought, so this is the spies, so, but the 10. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who have come from the Nephilim, and we have seemed... And we, have seemed to, we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. So they were worried. So what does this mean? Let's go over this scripture here for a second as we're going into it. So the Nephilim, as we talked about before, are the offspring that came from the fallen angels. In, the, in the Genesis calls them, and throughout the scripture, calls them sons of God, right? And when the sons of God came together with the, daughter, with the daughters of Adam, uh, normal human ladies, I, you know, then these offspring was born, and the Nephilim were a product of a rebellion from, this, from the spiritual realm. And so you have these take place, and this, and this uh, rebellion plagued the people of God throughout generations, as we see. Right, we're going to go more into that. And they were there, and they devoured them. Uh, more historical accounts, when you go into extra biblical literature, and historical accounts, the giants and the sons of Anak and the Nephilim were known to literally, which is why it says that in Numbers, so you get that, you get the mix match of, oh, that's why it says it. They were literally known to devour people. Right? They were just mean. They were uh, bad rulers, historically. And you see, this th- uh, you see this thing. They brought death and destruction. But these giants were who was standing in the way of Israel stepping into their promise, right? They came up to the land. They knew, they knew the land that they were spying out. They weren't just spying out any old land. What did they know? When they went in to spy out the land, what did they know? That this is the promised land, right? So they go in. They spy. They see giants. Like, whoa, man, we're grasshoppers. And they're literally going to devour us. we got to back up. And Joshua and Caleb were like, no, Right? And they're about to stone them, and the presence of God showed up and stopped them, that from happening. Right? But they were there, and, bec- and they did not go into the promise. They stayed outside, as we know. Right? But let's just fast forward again. We're going to go boop, boop, boop. Right? So we're going to fast forward into Joshua 11. So we know that these guys, that the spies brought back a bad report. Why? Because the sons of Anak, the Anakim, the Nephilim, were in the land, giants, and they were afraid. They were afraid. And they stood in between the claiming and receiving of God's promise. And they allowed fear and unbelief. They had fear of them. They didn't believe they could take them. And they're like, yo, we've got to run back to the desert. Let's go. Let's retreat. All right? So let's go back to Joshua here and see what Joshua did. Let's go to Joshua 11, 21 to 23. So Joshua, at that time, Joshua came and exterminated the the Anak... Uh, Anakites, from the hill country, from Hebron to Beer, from Anab, from the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Highlighted part. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. None of them were left in the land of the Israelites. Some remained in Gaza. Who took care of that guy? David. Right? Right in the forehead. Okay, anyway, 23, Joshua took all the land according to all that Yahweh had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal divisions, and the land rested from war. So here comes Joshua, comes into the land, 
and completely annihilates them. It says that Joshua utterly destroyed them. Some of your translations may say Joshua put, put them under the ban. That ban is talking about being destroyed if you see that. And you study that word verbiage out that, if you're reading that and you see that. That's what it's talking about. So Joshua comes in later. Him and Caleb, right, were the ones that said, hey, we can take it. God gave us this land. It's ours. So after that generation that had unbelief and fear died out, they did go into the land. And remember, what did Joshua, remember the two slides I put back to back for us? Joshua means Yahweh saves. Yahweh is my deliverer, right? Uh, Yahweh is my salvation. So you see this going into here. What did Jesus do? Jesus led us into the land of our inheritance And I don't want to step on the toes from next week because the next week has everything to do with inheritance and the love of Jesus Christ. But Jesus led us in there and through his act on the cross and through his giving us uh, the Holy Spirit and allowing us to become one with God, Jesus has utterly destroyed and annihilated anything that stands between us. It's amazing. So let's go into uh, here. These giants that Joshua, as I said before, we're going to kind of bounce between this numbers verse here. They kept Israel in fear and unbelief, which caused them to wander in the desert. And when you look at this, the crazy part of all this stuff is, is their inheritance was literally right there. And they didn't take it. They're like, no, we can't. Unbelief, fear, panic, chaos, and then fear they whispered into the ears of all the other Israelites, and they got the other Israelites in fear and a panic, and they all had to back up, and they left. Right? That's why it's always good to be in good company. Right? Find someone that's crazy, just as crazy as you, and believes that we can beat the giants. Right? Because I don't want to live my life in fear and unbelief and miss out and have the inheritances God has given us. Ephesians says that every single blessing in the heavenly realm has been given to you. I don't want to be standing right beside a blessing my whole life because fear and unbelief prevented me from stepping in and taking it. Every blessing in the heavenly realm has been given to you. Scripture, fact, right? And then Joshua led his army, right? What did he do? You see it on the slide. He led it past fear. So many times as you're reading Joshua, and many of you have said, hey, because of this sermon series, I've been reading Joshua. If you've been doing it, then you will see throughout Scripture in patterns how many times Joshua told Israelites, the Lord is going to fight for you. Instead of telling them, there's giants in the land, this, that, 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 right? He's like, no, forget what they said. The Lord is fighting for you. He has gone before you. The Lord is going to bring victory. They said, okay. He was constantly imparting truth into their hearts. That's why it's so important for us to know this, to put this in our hearts, and to keep on going. Because we need to know truth. Because when we come against the different giants in our life, the rulers and principalities in the spiritual realm, when we come against those giants, I want to know truth to stand on it. Because if you don't know this, you're going to back up. And we need to know this. We need to stand on this. We need to be confident on this. Someone sent me, I don't know who it was. You can put your hand up if you did. Someone sent me a video this week about saying, asking, uh, I don't know who, a guy, very popular guy, what's more important, praying or reading your Bible? And he said, what's more important, inhaling or exhaling? (laughs) Right? Who said that to me? Was it someone in here? Yeah, that was you, Deb. I knew it was someone in here. That was so good, right? You need to have your prayer. You need to have your worship. You need to have your your Bible reading. You need to know truth. So, assuring them. So how does this story here, we see the story, we understand it. We know that Joshua went into the promised land. We see that he just had a good time annihilating everyone, right, that the Lord had placed before him that was an enemy to him. And so how does this relate to us is the big question. And I just alluded to it. And I know I've used this verse a lot, but there's a reason why it's in Scripture. I said to my grow group, we, we took a different vein on Wednesday, but this was a verse that came in the grow group. Why would Paul mention ruler, spiritual rulers, authorities, and powers if they didn't mean anything? The biggest mistake as Christians that we can allow to be a part of our thought process is that when someone talks about a small g God, that it's just a fiction. It's not. Paul, said, Paul makes it very clear throughout Scripture that there are sp- evil rulers, spirits of darkness, that are against us. And now you and I are at war with them and these spiritual rulers, and uh, let me just read it, so we not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So, as Paul's writing this letter to Ephesians, let's just understand the framework here. As he's writing this to the Ephesians, what has already happened? The first point, Jesus has already 
died, resurrected, and ascended into glory with his Father. So he's writing this post. And so if we were not supposed to have spiritual warfare, I don't, the, the timing would be off. But the timing is here. Jesus died, resurrected, has gone up into glory. So we know that there. We know that at his, uh, his act on the cross. Yeah, I have the reference up there. It literally says, Scripture says, he disarmed, Jesus disarmed every ruler and authority by putting them to shame on the cross. So we know that. But there's still a wrestling here on earth. And I think everyone in this room has encountered that wrestling in one way or another. We encounter it more, stronger, in some seasons than others. Like we say, we always need to be ready for those that are walking through the valley, even if we're on the mountaintop. Because guess what? The way life goes, you are promised trials. And there are some points, the good shepherd, Psalms 23, he leads us beside still waters, and he leads us to the valley of the shadow of death. You and I will walk through that valley once, twice, who knows. But you and I will wrestle trials in our life. And we will wrestle up against, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against what we saw in Ephesians, principalities, spiritual uh, forms of darkness that are wrestling against us. They are, the Nephilim are the picture of this in the New Testament. As Joshua, as Jesus has led us into what we are, our promise is, what our inheritance is, our inheritance is something that's going to continue to flow as we have eternal life. We are wrestling against these things and we are claiming these things. Right now, we are in a stage where Jesus has already walked through the river like Joshua did and Joshua rolled back the river to Adam. We are already there, but we are in a spot when we are claiming our inheritances because we are not yet at a place where we are completely free from war. Remember that last verse in Joshua? And it said the land rested from war. We are not there because we are wrestling now. We are taking the land, so to speak. We are taking the inheritance. And we are going to fully be, whew, the greatest celebration of all time will be when we hear the trumpet. For some, they'll panic. For others, it's like, thank you. Some of us will think, it's about time, but we will never dare say it. But then he knows our thoughts. Just don't be like Sarah. I heard what you said in your thoughts. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. What we wrestle from, last point, against is trying to prevent us from being transformed into his image. That's what we are wrestling against. From glory to glory, becoming the likeness of our Savior, of our Joshua, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the King. Right? As the youth said many times, I don't know if you caught up there, and we totally agree, you can't be stagnant in your faith. The river is either flowing towards God or away from God. Which, which one are you in? Okay, so let's go back into this. And remember before, in week one, when I was kind of doing the intro, or whatever you want to call it, right? Remember I told you that, that we went over that por portion when the, when the Lord promised Joshua, and he said, wherever the soles of your feet go, what did he say? He said, the land is yours. Remember I said we're going to circle back to that? Here's the circling back. Right, so we have that promise, that figure of speech, that military term. Jesus is, promising, jo Jesus is pro promising Joshua, wherever you put the soles of your feet, it's yours. And we're going to go over a verse. We're going to go New Testament and then go Old Testament here in a second and really show that. It's going to be so powerful. Oh, my goodness. You got, ooh, just wait. It's right in Scripture. It's awesome. Man, the Bible is so cool. This part you've heard me preach probably a billion times. And just a heads up, you're going to hear probably a billion times more. All right? But we know this scene. The 72 returned with joy after Jesus sent them out. Lord, even the demons, principalities, rulers of darkness, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and all over all power of the enemy. Let's not just like, oh yeah, it's a good verse. Let's just let this set in to our minds and to our hearts. If you are a son or daughter of the Most High God, you have been given authority over this. But if you are not going to devour this, if you are not going to breathe in and out, then you will not be able to stand the way you expect to stand. Jesus is very clear that prayer opens up the realm of authority in your life. Very clear. So we know this scripture, we know it well. Probably have it memorized by now. Let's go into the Old Testament and look at the, oh, I love it. I can't wait. Ready? We're going to go into Joshua. Here we go. Let's go to Joshua 10. And this is when he comes into the land. And there was kings that came against Joshua. Read, let's read this verse together. Wow, wow. And when they brought these kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned, imagine the scene here. Live with me in the moment. 
Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with them, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. Check out the symbolism in that verse. And they came near and put their feet on their necks. And as they are doing this, they haven't conquered everything yet. There was still land that needed to be conquered. As they are doing this, as the leaders are coming up and coming to these kings that pose an enemy, and they were sticking their feet on the necks of their enemies over the kings of the nations that stood in, the, the groups that stood between them and receiving their promise. He's saying this over them as they're putting their feet on their necks. Do not be afraid or dismayed. Do not be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to your enemies against whom you fight. What a picture. That would have been a moment, and I know it's different because we have, with the, our revelation and knowledge of the Holy Spirit is different right now, but imagine the feeling as Joshua is declaring this over you as, the king, as their chiefs and warriors are coming along and they're putting their, neck, their feet on the necks of their enemies. And Joshua is speaking truth into their very hearts, into their minds, and saying, do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to your enemies against whom you fight. Jesus is saying to you, when you wrestle against your enemies, come, put your feet on the neck of that that comes against you. For behold, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age. I tell you the truth, the day is coming that you don't need to ask me anything, but you'll go straight to the Father, and when you use my name, it will be done for you. These are truths that the Lord is speaking over us as we are wrestling over the enemy, as we are putting our foot down on the neck of that which is trying to rob us from receiving our spiritual inheritance. I thought that was just cool. Okay, let's go to the next one. And this is, ooh, this is another good, okay, we need to capture, again, we need to capture imagery, right? I keep on saying, live with me in the moment. Let's go to, it's still in Joshua 10. One of these kings has a name, and we need to understand the significance. When, uh, Joshua 10, 1 to 2. Now it came to pass that Adonai Zedek, Zedek, or whatever, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken the city. And had utterly destroyed it, just as he had done to Jericho and its kings. So he had done to Ai and its kings and the inhabitants of Gibeon and made peace with Israel and, remained, and they remained among them. So he feared greatly because Gibeon was a large city. It was one of the royal cities, in fact, larger than Ai. And all its men were mighty. Who is this the king of that we see here in Scripture? We see another king of Jerusalem before this, except before it was named Jerusalem, does anyone know the name of the city? Salem. Who was the king of Salem that we know before an older scripture? Melchizedek. So you have Melchizedek that shows up to Abraham, or Abram, in that war that he brings out the bread and the wine, king of Salem, right? So between some period, Melchizedek is no longer on the scene, but this guy is on the scene, and he's an imposter, Want to know why he's an imposter? Because he's against Israel. His name means the Lord of righteousness. Melchizedek was the king of Salem, right? We are seeing that in today, are we not? A false sense of righteousness that is coming in the church where leaders are around the world in the church are beginning to call what is wrong right and claiming their actions as of what God would do, pretending to be leaders of righteousness, but really their leading has come from the pit of hell. A false falsehood in the religious realm is on the throne, claiming things that are righteous which are not. And those kings, it was one, this was one of the kings that Joshua had his men come around and say, put your foot on this guy's neck who claims to be righteous, but is not. Well, you and I only know there is only one Lord of righteousness, and his name is Jesus Christ. And anyone teaching something that is righteous, that is against here in the word, imposter, run. They are operating in the wrong spirit. Pray that they repent. A false standard of righteousness is trying to break in, right? And that's why it also says in Ephesians when we're talking about wrestling not against flesh and blood, finally, right, this is that little, my little highlighted part is Ephesians, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the evil schemes of the devil. Why? Because he's a father of lies. He's a deceiver. If we know he's a father of lies, it's like that portion of scripture. If you know the enemy's coming... 
What are we going to do a week beforehand if we know he's coming? If we hear rumor that the ships have landed on our shores, we are going to fortify our walls. We are going to have things in place, tar out in the fields so we can light those suckers on fire. We are going to protect everything we can. Let me ask you a question. What are you doing on a daily basis to make sure the father of lies isn't deceiving you? Because he wages war on you every single day. Whispering lies, this is okay. As one of the youth said here in the video, I forget who said it, but they said so many times, even in their high school, people try to package sin as it's not that bad. But it is. <laughs> Shane put it very bluntly, it's not a good idea. Shane, word of wisdom. It's not a good idea. The devil is the father of lies. And so you see this area here where there's a false lord of righteousness sitting in Jerusalem. God's holy city. And Joshua was like, uh-uh. I'm going in. And we're going to take this. It's the Lord. And I'm going to restore, not himself, but G the Lord, but the true Lord of righteousness in this land. In this land. Let's continue to go. Joshua 10. Let's stay in there. Joshua 10, 40. So Joshua conquered the entire country. The hill country. All these areas, the lowland and the slopes with all their kings. He left no survivors, but put everything that breathed under the ban, or annihilated everything, right, that the Lord had told them to. Just as Adonai, God of Israel, had commanded. So, what do the Nephilim represent today? The spiritual rulers and principalities, right, that Ephesians is talking about. That Jesus tells his disciples that they can have authority over. So we see this. This is the Old Testament. So let's go into understanding it in the New Testament, right? Let's, let's look at the mirror, the New Testament mirror. Whoops, wrong one. There we go. So after he sends them out, but this is it, right? After he sends them out, what does he say? The 72 returned with joy. I just went over this verse. Saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He sent the 72 out. Remember the first week I talked about it, and, and Brad is talking, I keep on re referencing this teaching, but there's these, in my opinion, the 70 nations is a teaching that you almost need to marinate on, right? But when you understand this, you understand that God, and we talked about Wednesday night, that God gave the, uh, the, the nations two other gods for a moment. He says it all over in Scripture. We talked about that in my grow group on Wednesday night. We see Scripture, Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. Jesus comes back and takes it all back. And I'll come back. Jesus comes on the stream and takes them all back. And he literally kicked out principalities of an entire region through the church. An entire region. We're going to go over that in a second. Right? So he tells them this. And this is also the, the Great Commission, right? Joshua went into the land, utterly destroyed it, right? Took, took it back for, for the Yahweh and gave it back to the people as an inheritance. And the land rested for more. Obviously, our part of the story is going to be different. But why did Israel begin to lose it? What happened? Their eyes turned from the Lord and turned to other gods. Not a good idea. But this is the one in Matthew. And Jesus came, to them, came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, thank you, Jesus, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So let's understand this. Remember as Joshua, if we go back one portion, right? It says Joshua conquered the entire country. Let's go under, and I know that right now we are not in the realm of eternity yet, so there's still going to be a wrestling. But we have a beautiful picture of what we can do in the name of Jesus through the power of his spirit in our midst, why we should constantly be pressing into it. So where is the fullness of this? I want you to look at this map by Business Insider. This is the spread of Christianity. Now, I'm sure it's not... 100% accurate to the T, but it's, it gives us a good picture. See this purple? Christ, Christianity. Right? So right after Jesus, this is like disciples starting to go out, right? The spread of Christianity. You see it here. So a little bit, a little bit of purple, right? Over the course of the ministry of the disciples and of Paul, boom. So right here, this basically, within reason, Except up there, but that's good stuff too. But this part right here basically represents the 70 nations. The 70 nations that were separated all the way back from Babel, Tower of Babel, okay? So look at that. So when Jesus started, but in the lifetime of Paul and his disciples, I mean, just look at that. 
Look at how little that is. Look how fast the spread of Christianity hit right now just from the lifetime of the, of, of, of the disciples and of Paul. Right? And so what did Jesus say? He said, go, right, make disciples. Joshua took the whole country. And then you have this. This stays purple. Keep this purple. And then almost 1,000 years, first it goes, when you look at the spread of Christianity, it actually, when it hit our shores, it came here first, came down here, and came down here, which would make sense because you hit it on the shores, right? But anyways, it came there first, and then the spread of Christianity started taking over this whole area. Right? And then from here, it went to here. So you still have more of the 70 nations up here. This area was lost due to uh, Islam, right? And then you have uh, this stuff right here that became... But you see, as we see this stuff here, that, the, that the, the taking of the gospel, the spreading of Christianity, literally went across the globe. globe. And there's, um, you know, Australia over there uh, that's all purple too, right? So you have the spreading of the gospel, and that is the picture. We see that happen as Joshua took the entire country... And we see Jesus telling his disciples, you and I are disciples, going to all the world and spread the gospel, right? This area is heavily, hev heavily evangelized, so is this area as well, right? There's Christianity there, but these are places that Christianity is, 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 is dominant, so to speak. And we need to understand something here, too, talking about the Lord of righteousness. We're coming down the, the home stretch here. You and I have a part of this. Like I said, let's just go over that again. We wrestle against principalities, the things that are trying to keep us from receiving our inheritance. Peace is your inheritance. Jesus gave you his peace. Peace is inheritance. Healing is inheritance. Health is inheritance. Joy is inheritance. Am I going to be joyful all the time? No. There's things that come to try and rob your joy. But as disciples of Christ, we need to be spiritually disciplined that when we, these things try to rob us of our peace, rob us of our joy, we need to be like, whoa, hold up. Adam's heard me say it, Pastor Todd's heard me say it, Brian's heard me say it when they've come in and we've been praying through different things. I said, my, my joy has been robbed right now, but don't worry. What do I say all the time? I'm going to pray about it and defeat this sucker. Because I refuse to allow my tent to be camped on anger, offense, fear, unbelief. It can't be there. I recognize when it's there. I tell them when I'm in it. I said, hey, I'm in a funk right now, but check back with me tomorrow. I'm going to deal with this thing. Whenever I go there, I go to war immediately. Because the longer you wait... Or if you tell yourself, oh, you deserve to be offended or upset or, or whatever. If the, Lord, the, the longer you allow yourself to stay in that place, the harder it is to get out of it. So you got to catch it. Be like, not today. I'm ticked off, but I'm going before my father, and I'm receiving what he's given me. Or I'm scared, I'm going before my father. I've been, I've been robbed of peace, I'm going before my father. Right? I'm not going to. So he, now, let's go back over to this Lord of Righteousness and go down to this home stretch. To do that, we're going to go to Daniel. We're going to understand. We're going to understand. So remember, there is this um, um, the king of Jerusalem, the fake Lord of Righteousness. There is also a fake Lord of Righteousness that is trying to be present in today's age as well. Which we know, and it's not the reincarnation of that king, someone else. Sorry. And I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one, like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Ha <laughs> ha. He approached the Ancient of Days and was brought into his presence. Dominion, glory, and sovereignty were given to him. That were given to him, that all the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Hallelujah. That word dominion there, remember last week we talked about and the government will be upon our shoulders and how I said that word government is actually, remember that from last week? Dominion, here it is right here, right? His dominion will be an everlasting dominion. So we need to talk about the falsehood, the false Lord of righteousness that's trying to be here, one that's trying to steal God's glory and is going to be removed. Just as the Adonai, Zedek from in, in Joshua, Zedek or whatever, as he was removed, so is this one going to be removed. Who else right now? And I'm not going to go into all the details. You can study it out. Let's go into these two people right here. Baal, Zeus. Baal was the head of the Canaanite pantheon. Zeus is the head of the uh, Roman, uh, Roman pantheon. Right? You have these guys that are there. You have Jupiter Baal. Right? You have all these ones that are there that are mentioned in Scripture. He was known, he, he was known as the Lord of Heaven. And look at this blasphemy. He rode on the clouds. There's only one who rides on the clouds, and that's the Son of Man. 
That's Jesus Christ. And so what is the point of all this right here? Baal or Zeus or whatever you want to. Obviously it's false. And all throughout Scripture, when Baal was there, or when you go post-Bible into the, into the Roman world, these other gods, spirits, are there to pull people away from the knowledge of God so that they no longer serve Him. However you want to see it. They pull people away from the worship of God. And it's at work today, pulling people away, eyes turning away. And usually they'll manifest themselves in their self-made hands. If I do this, then this will happen. I'll build my own. We're getting very dangerous with the beauty of technology today. It's beautiful with the mind of these scientists that have been given to put that kind of technology into being. But they, I told you last week, they're trying to make it. But what did God say? It said the gods, what did it say next, or Deuteronomy? The gods that they worship, they began to look like them. What are they trying to do with the human body? They're trying to put so much technology in you that you can think about turning off your light and it will turn off. You can look at it one way, but oh, that's great information. Yes, but you can also look at it as someone is building something and the God functioned my body to be perfect. And if I'm going to put a whole bunch of nonsense in my body, then I need to expect that my body is going to react to that kind of stuff, right? What we eat, what we allow in our foods. We know there's so much stuff in our foods that we eat that we just kind of turn a blind eye to because if you really understood it all, it would almost scare you. But we had digested anyways. And then we need a chemical to offset the chemical that has been put in our food. And then, I mean, let's make some more money. Let's put a watch on your wrist and so tell you that when the chemicals we put in your body that are fighting the other chemicals we put in your body, when they start to have a bad reaction, we'll let you know. I'll stop there, okay? You know where I'm going with that. So what happens here? Jesus defeats him. The spread of Christianity through the disciples defunds the worship of anti-gods. Baal is the anti-god, the substitute god instead of God. Ready for my translation or my transition? Slide's a good one. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go to the last two verses. And Matthew 24 to 20. Let's just see that again because it's just that good. <laughs> okay. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give us light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. The powers of heaven. God's not going to be shaken. He's not shaken. So who's shaken? Ha <laughs> ha. Come on. Yes. The powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. When the Lord of Righteousness has kicked the false Lord of Righteousness out of the land and said, you are done, Jesus Christ, Joshua, Joshua kicked the, the other king to the curb, Jesus is going to kick him to the curb. We're going to put our feet on our, his neck and we're going to enter into the fullness of our, of our eternity, of our promise, of our inheritance. No more sickness, shame, pain, tears, sorrow, but we're going to go into glory with Jesus forever and Jesus leads us there. After he defeats the false lord of the land, he's going to come down. And Jesus is going to show up, and psh, all the powers of heaven are going to be broken. Whoops, oh, no, no, calm down. Okay, all the powers of heaven. The last verse, then we're, then we're going to close for prayer. Just, so we see it with Jesus. Jesus is saying this, and then in Revelation, the same thing, right? We see it in Daniel. Jesus bears witness to it, and then we see, uh, and we see it in John. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Thank you, Lord. And made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the Lord that has led us into our inheritance. So don't forget this trials that we are wrestling now, that we see the picture of Israel. And when we see Israel, we know that we win. I promise you, there will be a day when we rest from war. But right there, we wrestle. And we take authority. And as we do it, before the land had totally rested from war, because Joshua still had to go kick other kings to the curb, before he did it, what did Joshua give the, his men the honor of doing? And what does Jesus give us the honor of doing? Behold, wherever you put your foot, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and all power of the darkness. Hey, boys, come here. Put your feet on their necks and know this, that Yahweh will be with you for the rest of your life. 
be courage, uh, have courage and be strengthened. That is the message for us this morning. Understand the authority that you've given. It's in and out scripture. Breathe it in with prayer and worship. Let's go and let's fight and let's stand in glory. Ooh, Pastor Todd, if you want to come up.